Good evening, everyone. My name is Marty Johannes, and I'm the careers and finance librarian for the Johnson County Library. We are fortunate tonight to have EVP Curtis, Development Officer at Assured Trust Company, presenting for us. And before I turn the program over to Evie, I want to tell you a little bit about her. Uh, Evie began her 45 plus year career in financial services as a bank teller for Bank of America in Atlanta and rose to the position of Senior Vice President and Relationship Manager for Bank of America in Kansas City. She then served for over a decade as Senior Vice President and Trust Officer for the Country Club Trust Company. And since March of 2021, Evie has been a development officer at Assured Trust Company, working with persons with disabilities and those who need a helping hand. Evie received a Bachelor of Arts in Economics and Math from Georgia State University and an MBA from Baker University. She's a national speaker on various estate planning topics, fundraising, advocacy, and financial abuse and exploitation. Evie's also been very involved in nonprofit volunteer work, serving in the past as board chair for a number of organizations, including the Foundation on Aging, the Kansas Advocates for Better Care, Mid-America Plan Giving Council, and Estate Planning Society of Kansas City, just to name a few. Uh, tonight for Q&A, Evie will answer questions after presenting on each of the five documents, and then at the end, we'll answer any other questions. As questions come to mind, please put them in the chat, and I will present them to Evie. And now, I'll turn it over to Evie Curtis. Thank you, Evie. Thank you, Marty. Um, every time Marty reads my introduction, I am shocked. I wonder who in the world could that person be? <laughs> well, this is actually one of my favorite presentations that I do. And the reason it's one of my favorite is because really the concepts are supposed to be so simple. And yet at a time when you actually need all of these documents, it, be, it can become very complicated. And hence why I have my little quote I made up that says, it all sounds so simple until it's your life. And when you actually need all of these things to start working, that's when you realize how complicated everything can become. Estate planning documents respond to three of our top fears, running out of money, fear of losing independence, and then losing our health. And while I can't solve all of these problems tonight, what I can do is offer you some tools to help you solve some of these problems for yourself. So we have an outline. We're gonna talk about the five basic estate planning documents first. There are many estate planning documents out there, but we're gonna talk about the five basic. We're gonna talk about how those documents work together. We're gonna to talk about where you should keep your documents. And then we're going to talk about, do you need an attorney to draft these documents? What about the internet? So let me address that last one first, because the issue of whether or not you need an attorney to draft these documents in this day of chat GP, Google, you know, everything that's out there on the internet, I'm going to tell you there are two of these basic estate planning documents that I'm going to actually tell you, yeah, you can download this one from the internet and it will be recognized in all 50 states. But the other three are going to be so individualized that there's no way anything that's on the internet is actually going to understand everything going on in your life and everything that is in your wish list. So I'm going to recommend that you do indeed seek out an estate planning professional. And how in the world do you find one? You can talk to your local banker. Um, if you happen to be in the Kansas and Missouri area, feel free to reach out to me and I'll give you a list of um, people that I've worked with over the years who I know do a wonderful job. 
At the end of our session today, we're going to take a look at the five basic estate planning mistakes that people make. And we're going to use that as our test to see, did I indeed cover everything you need tonight to overcome being someone who makes those mistakes? So that's going to be our checklist for later. The handout or the PowerPoint presentation is very detailed. And the reason it's detailed is not so you can read it on the screen. It's detailed so that you can actually have a reference source for later on. And I know we've got people definitely from Kansas and Missouri, but I also know we have people from Virginia and Colorado. And I want you to know, with the exception of the laws of intestacy, which we'll get to in a little bit, all of this information I'm presenting to you tonight covers all of the United States. So it doesn't matter what state that you're in. We're going to keep it simple. Well, as simple as I can make it. So we're going to start with the five basic documents. We're going to talk about what's a living will, what's a health care power of attorney, what's a financial power of attorney, what's your last will and testament, and what is a revocable living trust. You'll see the first four of those documents are starred. And then I've got a little asterisk down there that says everyone over 18 needs these documents. That would be a living will, a health care power of attorney, financial power of attorney, and a last will and testament. And yet I can guarantee you if I've got any 40 or 50 year olds in the audience, they're thinking, I'm not old enough to do any of this stuff yet. Yeah, you are. You're over 18. And if I have anyone on the line who happens to be under 18, please encourage mom and dad or grandma and grandpa to get their affairs in order. Let's start with a living will. A living will is not a last will and testament. A living will says, if I am facing a terminal medical condition, these are my instructions to the doctor in the hospital, in the event of that terminal illness, what are your wishes? Um, most people say, oh, this is the pull the plug document. And it actually is. This is the pull the plug document. But you might have specific wishes that you have should you be facing end of life. This is, this is your opportunity to give instructions to your doctor and to the hospital on your end of life decisions. Now, if you have specific instructions, more than pull the plug, you need to make sure that your doctor and hospital are willing to comply with the wishes that you have. Not all hospitals are willing to comply should you have some specific instructions. Now, some people have heard the term um, advanced directive or healthcare directive. The living will combined with our next document the durable power of attorney for healthcare decisions, that combination is known as an advanced directive or a, a healthcare directive. They can be separate documents or it can be one document. So a durable power of attorney for healthcare decisions simply says, if I can't make healthcare decisions for myself, this is who I'm going to appoint as my agent to make those decisions for me. Now, you're not in a life-ending medical crisis situation here. For instance, you could have been in a car wreck and you're unconscious, and someone needs to make the decision whether or not to do surgery to set your leg. You're not dying. You're going to be fine. But you need someone to be able to make those decisions for you. And that's going to be the agent. Now, whoever you select as your agent, you want to make sure they understand what your wishes are, what your standards are. You know, for instance, if you're facing a cancer situation, do you want to continue on with chemo? Do you want that next round of chemo? 
Whoever your agent is under your health care power of attorney, they are indeed obligating your financial resources. So if you don't want unnecessary test, you need to make sure your agent understands that. Um, when you combine the durable power of attorney for healthcare decisions and your living will, you can actually download this document off of the internet. And I put a website down at the bottom of this particular slide. It says Center for Practical Bioethics. Practicalbioethics.org is the website. Um, that form, the Healthcare Directive, Advanced Directive, Combination, Living Will, Healthcare Power of Attorney, is actually recognized in all 50 states. It's a great form to have for your kids those kids that are over 18, especially when they come over for, oh, I don't know, Thanksgiving's coming up. They come over for Thanksgiving and you say, by the way, before we have dinner, we're going to fill out this form. Now, the, the durable power of attorney for healthcare decisions side of that form does have to be notarized. You don't have to actually sign it that day. You do need to sign it in front of a notary when something needs to be notarized. So, um, but at least they'll have the form, they can fill it out on the spot, and they can put mom and dad in as agent or their spouses in as agent with you as a backup as an agent, but you can actually have that form done. Anybody can do that. Now, there's some additional documents around the healthcare piece. Um, and that's where you'll see the DNR forms. There are all different kinds of DNRs out there now. Do not resuscitate forms. Those are completed by your doctor. Next time you go for an annual checkup for your primary care doctor, say, oh, by the way, doc, I'd like to have a DNR form completed. They've got them in their office and maybe they'll go over these. Um, some people don't want an out and out right D DNR form. Some people only want um, a DNR, an out of the hospital DNR. So you'll be revived if you are out of the hospital, but if you're in the hospital, you don't want to be revived. So and they're all different kinds. And then there are some further documents, the POLST and the MOLST forms. Those are actually based on a medical evaluation. They're completed by the doctor and they actually take that DNR um, piece to the next level, put a little bit more detail in there because some people really do have very um, specific wishes should they be facing an end of life. So I'm going to stop there, um, Marty, and say when it comes to the living will and the durable power of attorney for healthcare decisions, if we have any questions up to now. Um, okay, Evie, um, one of our participants wants to uh, wants to know, she says, I have a 20-year-old and a 24-year-old. When should get, they get the, these documents in order? And how much will their information change over time? Well, their inf I would imagine their information is going to change quite a bit over time. So you're doing your documents for the way your life is today. I'm, I'm glad that question was asked because I probably should have told you this. Everything that we're going to talk about tonight, as your life changes, you need to change your documents. Nothing is, you're not putting anything in stone. You're only putting it in stone for this moment in time. And as you get married, as you get divorced, as you have more kids, as you win the Powerball, um, as stuff happens in your life, you want to update your documents. And all of these documents can be changed. Certainly someone who's 20 and 24 should have the two documents we just went over. And everyone can have it and it's free. So, And by the way, all the case law for these two documents um, is based on three 20 year olds, not old people with gray hair like me. So there you go, lesson to all of us. Marty, any other questions on those two?
Yes. Uh, can you speak more to the financial obligation required of your agent or power of attorney? I didn't realize they have a financial responsibility. Yeah. So the financial responsibility for your agent under your health care power of attorney is you're obligating whoever is in charge of your money to pay that bill. It's not you, the agent, that is obligated to pay the bill. It's using your own resources. And medical tests are extremely expensive. And that's why I say it's important for your agent to understand your wishes so that you do not pay any of those bills unnecessarily. Okay, and one more question. Okay. Is advanced medical directive the same as a living will? Um, it's, it's the same thing as the combination of a living will and a healthcare power of attorney. So those two documents together become your advanced directive, your healthcare directive. The words are tossed around a little too freely here. So unfortunately, you have to remember advanced directive, healthcare directive, combination of the two, or they can work independently with your living will, its own document, and your durable power of attorney for healthcare decisions, its own document. Okay, so that's it for now. Okay, uh, one more thing I thought about with the durable power of attorney for healthcare decisions. Most powers of attorney, we're going to talk about financial in just a minute. Most, po most powers of attorney end at your death. Um, the healthcare power of attorney, however, um, continues on after death until the body is disposed of. So the person you're naming as your agent under your healthcare power of attorney is actually going to be the one burying you. So keep that in mind, too. Okay. Moving on. The next one, way, way, way too important to have on one slide. Um, durable power of attorney for financial decisions. But yet, I have it on one slide. This is the document that authorizes someone to make financial decisions for you if you're unable to make them for yourself. So you can make it springing. That means it doesn't go into play until an event happens. For instance, um, you want a physician to say that you're unable to handle your financial affairs before it's effective. Or it can be effective the day you sign it. Um, it can be limited. You can have a durable power of attorney for someone to handle the farmland. You can have a durable power of attorney for someone to handle your bank accounts. And you can have a durable power of attorney for someone to handle your investments. You can have different people do different pieces, or you can have one, one person, your agent, to step in and handle all of your financial affairs. All financial powers of attorney end at death. And one of the most common mistakes that people make around this particular document is they go into the funeral home, find out how much mom's funeral is going to be, and then they, they, they go to the bank with their power of attorney and say, I am mom's power of attorney, and now I need to pay her funeral home. And the bank says, yeah, no, we froze that account when mom died. And your power of attorney is no good after mom's death. This is a very powerful document and it's becoming more and more powerful because of the nature of the assets that we're going to be talking about. Financial institutions want your document to be less than three years old. And some financial institutions won't even recognize a financial power of attorney. And I cannot tell you how frustrating that is to attorneys who draft these documents only to have their financial institutions say, yeah, we don't recognize it. Social Security doesn't recognize a financial power of attorney. The VA doesn't recognize a financial power of attorney. And even some brokerage firms don't recognize powers of attorney. If I were to give, give you um, a lesson today on financial abuse and exploitation, this would be the document that we would be talking about because this is the document that um, the people who are not good people use to do bad things to good people. 
So how do we overcome all of this? Um, the durable power of attorney for, for financial decisions, um, you have to go to your financial institution and say, I have gotten this document done by my attorney. Will you recognize it? And if your bank says, well, if you'll fill this form out, we'll recognize it. Or we like our own form and we need you to use your form to fill out our form. You can do that. You can do that. The most important thing was that you got your document done so that you can then fill out whatever whatever their document is. When it comes to Social Security, Social Security actually recognizes um, their own representative payee form. So in, in Social Security, when someone's going to step in and handle your Social Security, when you're incapacitated, you become a representative payee to Social Security. And Social Security now allows you to designate your preference on who those people will be. Um, the VA has a similar kind of form. And then your brokerage companies have their own particular kind of form for the most of them. What is this document control? Well, the biggest thing it controls is it controls all of our IRAs, our 401ks, all of those defined benefit plans, all of our retirement plans. And for most of us living today, and certainly for most of us working today, that is going to end up being our biggest asset. So it is very important to make sure you name the right agent. Um, it also controls our Facebook accounts, any of our online accounts, um, our digital assets. Uh, controls that, controls your tax return. It's, it's who's going to sign your, your tax return. I think this is a real good time for me to sort of pause and say, let's talk about who your agent should be under your power of attorney for financial decisions and under your health care power of attorney because you're appointing an agent under both of those documents. Your agent needs to be someone who actually knows what they're, do they're doing. It isn't a position of honor. It's a position of business. So you need to pick someone who actually understands Oh, I don't know the difference between a debit and a credit, just as basic as that, that you have to do a tax return every year. So there are financial things that need to be done, and your agent needs to understand what all of that means, that they're comfortable going into a bank. On the healthcare side of things, they need to recognize what your wishes are and your hopes and dreams are for your healthcare decisions. One of the issues with serving as an agent is there are no laws in the states that I think are represented here tonight. There are no laws that actually require the agent to serve. So you might name someone to serve in your document and that agent may say, yeah, no, I don't want to do that. That family's so messed up, I don't want any part of it. Or... I've got my own issues to deal with right now. I can't deal with this. Um, yeah, your agent's not obligated to serve. So it's another reason to be very careful about who you appoint as your agent. Doesn't have to be a family member. Um, it can be certainly be a family friend. Um, but if you do appoint an agent, whether it's under a financial power of attorney, attorney or a health care Make sure you ask the person that you've appointed as an agent and then always have a backup to that agent. OK, I'm going to stop on a durable power of attorney for financial decisions. And Marty, do we have any questions on that one? We don't have any questions. We can go on to the next one. That's because I was so perfectly clear in scaring you guys half to death. Exactly. Thank oh. you. <laughs> Last will and testament. This document says, when I die, anything that is titled in my name and my name alone, here's where I want it to go. If you happen to have minor children, this is the document that you use to name who you want the guardian to be for your minor children. So 
another perfect example of why this document is when you're younger, not necessarily just when you're as old as me. Last will and testament does appoint your personal representative. Sometimes they're called executors, sometimes they're called executrix, but that's the person who's in charge of carrying out your wishes. You can create trust through a last will and testament. For instance, Families with minor children can create a testamentary trust for the benefit of those minor children until they reach perhaps a certain age, if mom and dad were to die together. Um, a last will and testament is a matter of public record, and it does guarantee probate. Probate can be a good thing. It is super super supervised by the court by a judge. And so sometimes that is a very, very good thing to have that you know it's going to be done right. Now, a last will and testament can only control those things that are in your name and your name alone. So if you've got a joint account with your spouse, the money's going to go to your spouse in that account and not through your last will and testament. If you've got an IRA with a beneficiary designation to your three kids, that IRA is going to go to your three kids. It doesn't matter what your last will and testament says. If you've got a car and you've put a transfer on death, when you die, it goes to whoever you said transfer on death, not according to your last will and testament. Last will and testament only controls those things that in your name, that are in your name and your name alone. If you don't have a last will and testament, don't worry. The state has one for you. And I'm sure the state of Kansas and the state of Missouri and Colorado and Virginia, I know those two states are represented too tonight. I'm sure the states know exactly what you want done with your money. And um, so I put in here, you can see who gets what in Kansas, and then you can see who gets what in Missouri. Now, I don't have any of the other states in here, but you can look these up under the um, intestate succession in your state, and it will tell you. Now, I'm going to stop on the one in Kansas because I had a bit of an argument with a gentleman Um he and his wife, his wife has dementia, he has no will, and he has about six and a half million dollars. And he said to me, well, what's going to happen if I don't bother making a will? I don't really want to. I don't want to go see an attorney. They're going to charge me a fortune. Um, and I said, uh, well, you know, when you pass away, your spouse is going to get half of your money and your daughter's going to get the other half. And he said, I don't want my daughter to get the other half. I want my spouse to get everything. And I said, yeah, too bad. State of Kansas thinks different. So if you don't like what the state has prepared for you, then you need to do your own last will and testament. Now, unlike an agent, a personal representative executor, executrix, actually is supervised by the court. So this is someone, if they agree to serve, actually has to carry out your wishes and has to abide by the document because it is verified that you did indeed do this job properly. I think that's a good thing. I don't think it's a bad thing at all. Marty, did we have any questions on last will and testament? Um, one question, what are the advantages and disadvantages of having your spouse as your primary power of attorney? Oh, I, I think there's all the advantages in the world of having your spouse. Um, when you lose your spouse, you need to make sure you update your documents. Or if, or if your spouse is facing a health challenge and you feel like, Maybe my spouse can't make those decisions right now. It's time to update your documents. But um, most husbands and wives do have uh, their spouse listed. Now, um, I have had husbands and wives say, yeah, 
That's not who I want to make the decision. Remember, this is your decision and your decision alone. So it's entirely up to you. I, I am going to mention one thing. I was just, I don't know why. Um, you know, the proverbial reading of the will back in the day when everybody got together and we read the will and people found out they were not inheriting or they weren't getting anything, blah, 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 blah. We don't really do that reading of the will anymore. So that doesn't happen anymore. Um, when it comes to your last will and testament, it's actually the thing that's going to be controlling your Bitcoin account. So all of you out there who are investing in Bitcoin on the side, you know, you need to mention those Bitcoins in there on who you want to have it and how to access it. And if you've got any pets, um, all of us pet lovers, some of us like pets better than we like our children. So any of us pet lovers out there, you know, whether it's horses, cats, dogs, cows, whatever it is, um, this is also controlled through your last will and testament. So those are important things to think about. Oh, okay. Uh, Evie, we do have one more question. Okay. Uh, is an adopted child considered over a blood cousin when it comes to inheritance? It, you can you can have an adopted child be considered by saying specifically that in your last will and testament if you want to. So your last will and testament, um, our children have no right to inherit from us, by the way. We can choose to leave our money to whomever we choose. So, um, you know, if you do, if you have preferences that are not according to bloodline, first stirpes is kind of the term we throw out there, but according to bloodline, then you do, in need, you do indeed really need to put that in writing. And um, speaking of in writing, all of these documents shouldn't be so legalized that you can't even understand what they mean. If you can't understand what they mean, you tell your attorney, um, could you please put this in English for me so I understand what it means? Uh, I know as someone who actually has to work with these documents on a regular basis, we actually prefer English to legalese um, and don't see it enough. And most people go, I have no idea what my document says. Well, if you don't have any idea what your document says, you know, maybe whoever's handling your affairs won't either. So just a thought. Oh, and Evie, we do have one more question. Uh-huh. Um, actually, several more. Oh, um, what, darn happens, it. what happens if you don't have a will and no immediate family? Oh. That becomes a nightmare because everyone, you may not have an immediate family, but you have distant family. And it is up to whoever has been appointed to settle your affairs to find that family. Um, there are firms that we use, professional firms that we use to track down beneficiaries. So, um, yeah, your, your estate will pay to find the people to inherit your money, um, but... That's what happens. So, and and I can't tell you, I, I also have had people say to me, well, I don't have anything. We all have something. We got clothes on our back. We're driving a car. Um, we might be living in a house. Um, we all have something. We got stuff. We got stuff. This is a real good time to talk about personal property lists. Well, actually, I'll wait till we do the next document. Um, we'll okay. talk about some of that stuff in a minute because it causes a lot of problems. Okay, one last question. Uh huh. Does a last will and testament have to be written with a professional or can it be self-written and notarized to be considered by the law or the court? It depends on the state you live in. So you need to know and you can look up these rules. It's written in the statute. You can say... Um, the rules for writing my own will in the state of Kansas, because some states require two witnesses. Some states say there's an asset amount, which if you're above the asset amount, you can't do a self-proof, a, a, a self-written will. 
If it's below the amount, you can. If you're on your deathbed, you can do some in some states. So you'll have to look up the statute for your state to see if you can do this. I will tell you, it is more of a challenge to actually settle a will that has been handwritten than you would think. Doing a last will and testament is not that expensive. It really isn't. So it's worth doing. Okay. Moving on. Moving on. Moving on. How am I doing on time? Woo! Woo! Okay. Whoops. Kansas, Missouri. Revocable Living Trust. A revocable living trust is the most powerful estate planning document we have. It works during your lifetime, when you become incapacitated, and after you die. You do a revocable living trust now. And as your life changes, you amend your document. Sometimes you restate your document. If you've gotten so many amendments in there, then there comes a time where you just restate the whole thing. But a revocable living trust lives whether you're, whether it's your just regular old lifetime, when you're incapacitated, and it can live on even after death. After you become incapacitated or die, your trust, your revocable living trust becomes irrevocable and it can no longer be changed. And I think that kind of makes sense because it's revocable by you during your lifetime. And then it's kind of nice to know that if you can no longer control the changes, no one else can go in there and make them either. I'm going to give you a little vocabulary now. So there's three parties to a trust. Um, sometimes the person who sets up the trust is called a grantor, a settlor, or a trustor. Um, it's the person who sets up the trust. That's all it is. And it can be called any one of those words. The trustee is the person who can take care of the trust assets. Some, and then also you'll be naming a successor trustee. If that person becomes incapacitated, who's next up to be the trustee? And then finally, the beneficiary is for whom the trust benefits. During your lifetime, you can be the grantor, you can be your own trustee, and you can be the beneficiary. Husbands and wives, we see joint trust all the time. Um, both husband and wife are the grantors. Both husband and wife are the trustees. They can act independently or you can have it act jointly. Successor trustee, trustee can be whoever. Um, well, it can be the spouse who um, lives. And, um, and then you can have even a successor further on down the line after the second spouse passes away. And then the beneficiary can be both husband and wife. Um, individually as our individual needs are, or um, they can jointly make decisions. It's just entirely, it's as flexible as your relationships are. So, but it, it is a powerful document. It is private. Um, it avoids probate. So, you know, those movie stars that fail to make any kind of estate plan, we can get all of it really nitty gritty details out of those estates. But the ones that actually make a trust will never know how much money they had and what happened to it because it is private. And the only people that have access to what your trust says are the people who will benefit or who are beneficiaries of that trust. The kicker to having a revocable living trust is it can only control those assets that are titled in the name of the trust. When your attorney prepares this document for you, if they don't help you with the titling, they will actually give you um, a packet of information that says, Here's what you do with your bank accounts. Here's what you do with your brokerage accounts. It will actually tell you how to get your assets titled properly in the name of the trust. And your trust document will tell you what the name of your trust is. Um, 
Back in the day, we used to use a revocable living trust as a tax planning tool also. But now that our state tax exemption is $12.92 million per person, and in 2024, it's going to be $13,610,000 per person, most people don't need it for tax planning. But I am going to share with you that it is predicted that by 2026, our beloved Congress will probably be tackling this particular topic and um, reducing that estate tax exemption significantly. Um, what I hear most often is um, it will be reduced to around $5 million per person. So unless your estate exceeds, um, right now, unless your estate exceeds ex exceeds more than $13 million, you're good to go with just a plain old revocable living trust. Missouri and Kansas, by the way, have no state death tax, and Colorado and Virginia also have no state death tax. So we only have death taxes when our estates are way up there. So Bill Gates, yeah, you might have some estate taxes to pay, but most of us are not going to have to worry about estate taxes. Okay, powerful, powerful document and probably the most flexible of all the documents we have. Only controls those things that are named in our trust. An IRA and a 401k plan cannot be put in a trust name. The beneficiary can be a trust, but they can they themselves cannot be put into a trust name, just as an FYI. Marty, any questions on a revocable living trust? I think you may have just answered the one question I've got so far, which is, can IRAs be placed under a living trust? The beneficiary of an IRA can be your trust. Um, for tax planning purposes, before you make any beneficiary designations, husband and wives, you should always name your spouse first. This is for tax reasons. If you have other reasons not to name your spouse, that's an entirely different issue. But um, for tax reason, your spouse should be named first and your trust second. Okay, um, that's it for now. Yeah. Okay, so how do these documents work together? The advanced directive, healthcare directive, remember that's the combination of our living will and our healthcare power of attorney. They control the person, your body, just your body. Your financial power of attorney, your last will and testament, and your revocable living trust control the money and the stuff. So I'm going to stop here right now with the stuff personal property. Personal property is things that are not titled. My wedding ring on my finger has no title. The clothes on my back have no title. My gun collection has no title. I don't have a gun collection, but certain things have no title. Your car has a title, your camper has a title, your boat has a title. Your railroad car has a title. Um, some things have title, other things don't. When it comes to your stuff, your last will and testament and your revocable living trust allow you to actually have what we call a personal property list. And this says you have to fill it out, you have to sign and date it, but this list says I want my jewelry to be shared among my three grandchildren. I want my quilts to go to my favorite sister. I want my gun collection to go to my oldest son. 
whatever you want with your things, you actually have to write it down. Now, as a trustee who serves under these documents, I will tell you I go into homes and you can lift up a lamp and on the bottom is a little sticker and it says, um, this lamp goes to Evie. Yeah, technically that doesn't work. Um, and I'm going to tell you your stuff, even though our kids say, I don't want anything. I don't want anything you have. I, I don't want your stuff. I just don't want it. Um, yeah, they do after you die. There's always that one thing um, that maybe you don't want, but the a spouse of one of your kids wants and they'll make your kid's life miserable. Um, so stuff causes problems. When it comes to personal property, please document where you want that to go. Don't use stickers and, and, and don't share information with your, with your group, with your family or friends thinking they'll honor whatever your wishes were. No, they won't. No, they won't. So the stuff causes problems. Get your list done. All right. Healthcare powers of attorney, uh, financial powers of attorney, name an agent to serve on your behalf. Make sure you put a successor agent in there just in case the agent can't serve or is unwilling to serve. Um, you can have your healthcare power of attorney be the same person as your financial power of attorney agent. That's okay. Your agents can be the same in both documents. And remember, the court's going to supervise the executor or the personal representative. There is no court that supervises trust administration, but there are laws to make sure that the trustee indeed does their job right. And you see, well, we see them all the time, lawsuits all the time. Um, where a family sue because other family members have not done their job right. So your documents work together, whether it's we're talking about the person, the stuff, or your financial resources. And that's why you got to have all those pieces. So moving on to the next one, how do they work together? During your lifetime, your revocable living trust is alive and well, and it is ready to, to do whatever you need to do. So you take this to the bank when you renew your CDs and when you win the lottery and have to invest all that money, um, you take your that to your investment advisor and they make sure all those assets are titled properly because they actually can see the document and see how to title it. All the other documents that we've talked about tonight, they're kind of on standby during your lifetime when your life is just running, chugging along. When something happens to you and you become incapacitated, and most of us are going to have a period of incapacity before death, most of us do not have the luxury of dropping dead. We all wish we could just go to sleep at night and not wake, in, wake up in the morning when it's our time, but unfortunately, most of us are going to have a period of incapacity. And that's when these documents kick in. Your healthcare power of attorney comes into play. Your financial power of attorney comes into play. Your revocable living trust, now it's irrevocable. It is still in play. And then your living will comes in play. That's your instructions to the doctor in the hospital. After you die, your last will and testament steps in. It only steps in at death. It's the only time it's used. And your revocable living trust, it's still there. Now, if you're someone who has both a last will and testament and a revocable living trust, usually your last will and testament at this point becomes a pour over document into your trust. So your last will and testament says, if I didn't title everything in the name of my trust like I was supposed to at my death, go through the probate process and pour it over into my trust before you, trustee, distribute it to my heirs. So that's when your documents are used. Some during lifetime, most during incapacity, and some at death. 
Now, I hope this list, just by virtue of sheer numbers, is a good reminder to all of us. Most of us think in terms of death when we do this estate planning. And I hope all of this shows you, maybe you should put a little bit more, more thought into incapacity. First of all, it's one of our biggest fears. And second of all, that's when most of this stuff is going to be used. So think a little bit more about incapacity and what your wishes are during a period of incapacity. Um, after death, you know what? After the body is taken care of, there are no emergencies. There are no emergencies. There are a lot of emergencies during incapacity. Okay. Well, what in the world should we do with all these documents if, oh, wait, sorry, Marty. Questions at this point? We do have a couple of questions. The first one is, why do you need a revoc revocable living trust if you have a last will and testament? Well, you don't have to have a revocable living trust if you have a last will and testament. Um, some people want to avoid probate. Some people don't want their last will and testament to be a matter of public record, and it would be. Um, and a last will and testament as long as you've got a financial power of attorney and a healthcare power of attorney that are good documents, um, you may not need a revocable living trust at all. So some people actually want their um, affairs to be private. They don't want to have to go through probate. Maybe they experience a very bad case of probate with another family member. So that's when you have a revocable living trust. It's entirely up to you. That, remember when I said there are five estate planning documents, four of them everyone needs, and one's optional. And the one that's optional is a revocable living trust, and it's because it's your preference. Okay. The next question, why do some families decide to have an estate sale in lieu of a personal property list, along with who receives those items? Is there an advantage to the estate sale instead? Uh, great question. Um, when it comes to estate sales, um, I, you know, I'm just thinking the thousands of documents that I have read in my career and maybe three of them, okay, five, have had personal property lists completed. The reason estate sales are done is because we didn't complete a personal property list. So we still got to get rid of the stuff, right? Um, but what happens is um, that's where the disagreements come in play. You know, people say, why should I buy it? It was mom and dad's. Why should I buy it? Well, the truth is all of this stuff is owned by your, all of your personal property is owned by you um, and must go through either probate, which means you got to put money. Remember, it was being supervised. So you got to put money back in the kitty and then through or through your trust. If you if you actually had a completed personal property list and you have a trust and their assets. And so your trustee or your executor is obligated to do the best thing according to the law for your trust and for your estate, which means we need to get money for those items. So we can't just give them away, can't give them away, even though we want to, we want to say, oh, pick out what you want. Nope, can't do it. Okay, next question. Who needs Our, a trust? Do what? Um, who needs a trust? I think if you know that one of you has a health, uh, for instance, you know you've got an MS diagnosis, multiple sclerosis, or you've got a Parkinson's diagnosis, that there's this chance of incapacity in your future or a higher chance of incapacity. Uh, that's the power of a revocable living trust. And I think that's when you want to actually consider. Also, if you have considerable wealth, or if you don't want all the money distributed after your death, you want it held in trust for the benefit of, I don't know, maybe you want to benefit some, uh, have you have, let's say you have three kids and you want 
one, uh, one fourth to each one of those three kids, and then one fourth to go to grandchildren to pay for their college education. That means money has to be held for a period of time, and you need a trust to be able to do that. And we can create some trust through a last will and testament. Um, so before I make everything a little bit too complicated, let me just say a revocable living trust has a little bit more flexibility um, because your last will and testament doesn't kick in until you die. Okay. Did I get that one or did I get way off on a tangent? Okay. Sounds good. Um, the definition of incapacitated, what is it? <sighs> well, the technical definition is unable to handle your affairs. So in some documents, your the definition will be where two physicians, for instance, have said you're unable to handle your affairs, <clears throat> whether that's healthcare decisions or financial decisions. Um, you can also put in your documents things like, or I no longer recognize my spouse, or I don't know my family members. Or your document could say, where I have a panel of people, um, my best friend and my sister and my oldest child say that I'm no longer able to handle my affairs. You can define what incapacity is for you. Okay. So, I mean, unable to handle your affairs, shoot, that could be when I'm having a bad day. You know, you just never know. So it's it's a loosey-goosey um, definition. You can make it specific in your document. Okay. We're not done. Next question. Uh-oh. So does a revocable trust avoid probate completely? Yes. If everything you have was titled in your trust properly. Okay. No, if we have to go through your last will and testament because you forgot that CD or another thing that is very common is um, people bought life insurance policies back in the day and then life insurance companies started issuing shares. You know, they changed the nature of the beast and those 12 shares of prudential stock, um, you know, you never got around to retitling that in your trust. That's going to end up going through probate before it pours over in your trust and we can get rid of it. Uh, that's a very common one that we end up using probate for. And we can do small estate affidavits in most states. So if it's under a certain value, we don't actually have to go through probate, but it is a small estate affidavit and it does go through your last will and testament. So, um, you know, we we want you to have all those documents, but just in case we're going to use that last will and testament to pour over into your trust. But I have seen people who had nothing that needed to go through probate. Absolutely. And those were the people that did their homework. So. Another question. How do you make sure money doesn't get distributed before the bills get paid out? Well, common issue when families are serving as the trustee. Um, so... In most states, you have to publish notice to creditors for creditors to turn in bills. And we as trustees or executors, we really are supposed to hold funds back. In other words, retain all of the funds until such time as that creditor notice has run out and all of those bills have been submitted. Um, because bills are supposed to be fit, paid first before any distributions are done. I've had family members ask me at the graveside um, for a distribution so they can afford to fly back home. And my answer is always no, there will be no distribution until the creditor period has run. 
For instance, in Kansas, it's four months. In Missouri, it's six months. But creditors can have up to a year in Missouri. Do we hold all the money for that entire year? No. If we think we've gotten everything that's reasonable, um, we'll hold it for the six months. But you have to pay your creditors first before you can make any distribution. Okay, we've got some more questions. Oh, darn it. <laughs> Can a trust protect property from all going to the state for nursing home cost? No. Okay. Another question. Isn't there a pour over will that takes care of forgotten items up to some amount? Yes. That's what, if you've got a revocable living trust, then most likely your will is a pour over will. Your last will and testament becomes a pour over will. It doesn't say on it pour over will. It says last will and testament. But then when you read the document, it says, it says, blah, 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 blah. and then it says, and put anything that goes through this will into my revocable living trust. Okay. And then a last question, um, but how do you pay after death? Oh, pay on death, P-O-D. So pay on death is, it's just a designation that allows, um, for instance, on my, my checking account, I can put, my checking account can be in my name and I can put a pay on death to my two children. And okay. that way, when I pass away, that checking account automatically goes to my two children once they produce a death certificate and walk in the bank with it. So pay on death, very powerful way to distribute assets. Um, transfer on death is another way. Most states allow PODs and TODs. Okay. Okay. So what should we do with our documents once we get them done? Um, you should only have one last will and testament and maybe protect that. Um, I am going to say, however, if you happen to have a dysfunctional family and one that totally disagrees with mom and dad or mom and dad are doing something unique with their assets, sometimes it's good to keep all of the will, last will and testaments to show that, uh, you know, you were not out of your mind when you made your last will and test, last, last will and testament. Um, but you only have one of those and it's an original. And so you're, you're, not going to sign multiple original last will and testaments, just one. Next thing I want you to think about is who's going to use your documents, and that should help guide you where you should keep your documents. So your healthcare power of attorney, you're not going to use that document. Remember, you're appointing an agent to step in for you when you can't speak for yourself. So your agent should have that document. Um, you can have as many originals as you want of this document, but hopefully when I say a many, it's only, it's the same document, but you sign multiple originals. Um, you know, if you go to the, if you go in for surgery, um, they'll ask you when you check in at the hospital, do you have a healthcare power of attorney? And you should be bringing that to the hospital with you when you go to the hospital. Never assume they have a copy of it. Your living will. Your living will should be on file with your doctor's office and to the hospital that you use most often. Now, that's not going to say that um, you can file this in one state and you may die in another state. That's fine. But I'm just saying put your living will on file with your doctor's office and the hospital you use most often. Last will and testament. You're going to be dead when this document is used. So you, you want to keep it in a safe place but your executor needs to know where it is. Your revocable living trust, you're using this document during your lifetime um, at incapacity and after death. So this is probably one of your documents that you wanna keep at home. And I actually recommend to people that you, maybe for your documents, maybe the last will and testament is the only one you put in a safe deposit box, but because remember, you're dead when we need a last will and testament, and there's no emergency when you're dead. No emergency. Um, but the other documents, maybe keep them in a place and tell your families where you have put these documents, where they can find them. You know, it's the hot pink notebook on the third shelf in mom's closet or it's on, it's in the desk drawer. 
but it's the bright yellow folder or what, just make it recognizable and keep everything in one place. Um, if you get an urge to, you know, remember that you want to make a change to your documents, try not to write on your original documents, just use a separate piece of paper, put a sticky note on there. Um, and when life changes, change your documents. It's a good thing. Those personal property lists, once you make a personal property list, make sure it is with your revocable living trust or your last will and testament. Make sure it can be found. If you change your mind, all you have to do is cross through it. It doesn't have to be typed. It can be in your own writing. It simply must be signed and dated, and it must be with your documents so that it can be found. So where you should keep your documents? I don't always recommend that you need a safe deposit box. Unless you've got that family that you really don't want them messing in your business, and then you can keep it in a safe deposit box. But healthcare powers of attorney are used at 2 a.m. on Saturday morning, guaranteed. They're not used Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. Saturday morning, 2 a.m. That's when a healthcare power of attorney is used in my life experience. Okay. Let's check a few things because I'm pushing my time. Oh, shoot. I'm over my time. Okay. Five top estate planning mistakes. I Maybe actually do a whole time. Don't worry yes. about going over time. Just, oh, just keep going. Just keep going. Okay. So I do a whole program on the top five estate planning mistakes, but I've discovered that I can use it as a checklist for this program. So did we cover not doing anything? If you leave here and, and you think you can still do nothing, I clearly didn't do my job. Do not use the excuse by saying, I don't have anything. Yes, you do. Let the kids figure out. They won't. It'll be a mess. Death is easy. Incapacity isn't. If any of your beneficiaries are disabled, you need some specialized planning done need a specialized plan. And then don't forget about that personal property because it's going to cause arguments. Number two, not understanding the roles in your estate plan. You have different roles in your estate plan. You have an agent, you have a trustee, and you have an executor. Your agent, um, and all of these can be the same person or they can be different people. But make sure you know why you've appointed that person to be. And please don't let it be because it's the oldest boy in the family or the oldest child in the family. Or, you know, make sure that you've put some thought into why are you naming this person in your estate plan and share that information with them. Oh, shoot. That's one of my mistakes. So we'll get to it in a minute. Number three, where are your documents? You want to make sure they're accessible by those people who are going to actually need to use them. Your burial plan. Oh, you had a burial plan? We didn't even know you had a burial plan. Where's your burial plan? What about online accounts? If you're one of those people, I'm one of them, all of my brokerage accounts are all online. I don't even receive a statement through the mail. Well, how in the world is anybody going to know I have an online brokerage account? So they need to know how to access that on that I have. Number one, I have an online account. Number two, that I have a sign on and I have a password. And I know every single um, person on cybersecurity is going to tell you, never write down your sign-ons and passwords. And I'm here to tell you, write down your sign-ons and passwords. Somebody needs to be able to find them. Just have it in a spot. And by the way, keep it updated um, where someone can actually find it. So, and if you have any Bitcoin, oh, don't you just love that Bitcoin example from years ago where the guy couldn't find his password and oh, well, all that money he lost. So number four, not talking to your spouse and to your family members. So Sometimes you have to have those conversations with your family members. And if you've got a blended family, I am here to tell you, I actually, I honestly, to the depths of my soul, believe you actually need to tell your family how you want them to treat your second wife, your third husband, how you want them to treat each other after your death. Because 
blended families implode. Um, make sure your family's willing to honor your wishes. And if you've got specific wishes, you tell them what those wishes are and you say, here's what I want to happen. Certainly when it comes to burial, do you want to be cremated or do you not want to be cremated? That is a biggie. That's a biggie. Make sure that's known. Um, if your decisions are divisive, just make sure family members understand. Like I have shared with my children what my wishes are. And I have said, I will come back from the grave and pull every hair in your head out if you don't honor them. Um, you know, just tell your families why you've made the decisions that you have or that the decisions you've made, if you don't want to reveal anything, and I'm not talking revealing numbers, I'm talking wishes. Um, for instance, you can say, what I have put in my trust document, it may not seem fair to you. It is what I want. It is my wishes. You explain that to them. And then the last thing is, the last mistake I make, I see is where people will go to all the trouble to have a revocable living trust done and then not have anything titled in the name of their trust. And that's as if you actually didn't have a revocable living trust. Um, so it's important for you to kind of pay attention to what, what documents you need. Everybody doesn't need five, but everybody needs four. Some people need more. If you're one of those wealthier folks among us, maybe you even need a little bit more planning. We're just talking basics here tonight. Oh, and I think that's it. Okay, we have just one last question. I'm ready. And it's about a TOD. Um, uh -huh. uh, does that work for a checking account that's in a trust name? It's going to go according to the titling. So remember, it says transfer on death. So the trust lives on. The trust doesn't die. So the answer is no, the trust is going to rule. So don't do that because um, don't have the confusion there for what happens then is the bank's going to have to send it to the corporate council and have everything reviewed. So, so a follow on question, if we have a TOD on a bank account, does it need to be titled with the trust? No, no. Transfer. It is, it's a transfer on death. It's titled in your name, your name. And at death, it transfers to and it can tra transfer to your trust. So you can have your checking account, savings account in your name alone. Evie Curtis transfer on death to Robbie Curtis. OK, well, or. Evie Curtis Revocable Living Trust. Okay. So you're getting lots of thank yous and kudos in the chat. Um, I thank you for providing this wonderful presentation, not once in person, but a second time uh, online so that people who are on the wait list could be accommodated, and also so that we can make this available in our personal finance archive. So thank you, Evie. Uh, this is the last career and finance program for this semester here at, at uh, Johnson County Library. This program will be added to our personal finance online programs archive, which is on our website at jocolibrary.org. You can also access recordings of other previous programs in this archive. So I thank you all for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your evening.